to order at 6 o'clock and declare for a quorum is present. Um, could please stand and uh, invocation be led by uh, Mr. Dunn and our pledges of allegiance be led by Matt Griffith students, uh, Laisha Diaz, Natasha Alvarenga, and Brian Valdez. That's right. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, are just so thankful to be able to be here tonight. Uh, Father, thank you for the beautiful weather, for the change in seasons. Uh, Father, it's, uh, it's just a breath of freshness. Uh, Father, we just ask that uh, you continue to be with our, our district. Father, thank you so much for uh, for the numbers of uh, the, the illness uh, going down. Just uh, pray that you would just uh, be with our, um, our our district and their continued efforts and to be diligent on that. Father, we just ask that the uh, things that are, are said and done here tonight be pleasing to you. And, uh, Father, we just uh, love you and uh, uh, forgive what we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
Redistricting is the process of examining our elective units um, and rebalancing, rebalancing those elective units in response to changes in population. In a school district, those elective units are known as single member districts. Your trustees are elected from specific geographic areas called single member districts. That population change, that interval, is every 10 years because that's when the federal government takes the census and then a year later makes it available to all jurisdictions, including states and sub-jurisdictions. So by law, by the uh, um, education code, you are required to redistrict, required to respond to the data that the Census Bureau um, um, releases by rebalancing your single member district, so shifting population, um, if the census data indicates the difference between your most populous district and your least populous district is greater than 10%. Because what that is a proxy for is that it's no longer a well-balanced system. Your SMDs are no longer substantially of equal size. Um, in terms of redistricting, both federal law and state law does not require your SMDs to be exactly equal, but it does require that they be relatively or substantially equal, and how we capture that mathematically is looking at the difference between your most and least populous di um, district. If there is a greater than 10% variance, we got to come back into balance, not by being exactly equal, but within that 10%. And you don't get a greater gold star if you're at 9.9 .9 versus if you're 1.2. You just got to be under 10%. And there's some other things that we we take into consideration. So being at 9.9 .9 for a given school district actually may be better um, than being at 1.2 if, for example, being at 9.9 .9 prevents you from having retrogression with respect to minority voting rights. If we have to be at 9.9, .9, meaning that your districts are a little bit more unbalanced, but not at the 10% threshold, but it's preserving relative minority voting strength in comparison with your last plan, we would do that over at being 1.2 and risking violating a federal statute, which would, um, which would mean that we have some re retrogression in minority voting rights. So those are just to begin thinking about how some of those things begin working together. So we know what triggers redistricting, being outside that 10% variance when we look at the difference between your most and least populous districts. But when do we have to get this done? The, election, the education code also describes that. And it says that we have to get this done by the 90th day before the first election that we could act on the data. The data came out in August in raw form and continued to come out um, through the month of September. And so the first election that you can act on that data is your May of 22 election, which was 90 days before it means February 6th of 2022 because you're required to hold elections on that May day. But the problem with that February date, if you think about when candidates file for places on the ballot, February 6th is sandwiched in between the first day to file and the last day to file. The first day to file is in January of 2022, kind of mid-January, and the last day to file is in mid-February. So if we want to be the most fair to folks seeking election, including incumbents seeking re-election, we want to have our S&Ds that are going to be staggeredly brought on as terms expire, ready to go by the beginning of January so folks know the boundaries they need to live within in order to be eligible to run for office. So although we legally have until February 6th of 2022, in order to beat that filing de de deadline in January, we really want to complete this by the end of December. Here we are in October. So we've got a lot to get done between now and the end of December if we want to be ready um, for that first data file deadline in January. So what has to be done so that we can meet that first data file? Well, first of all, you need to understand the demographic analysis. You need to understand what has changed since 2010. Are we required um, to redistrict? And if we are, what can we consider as we bring the district back into balance, back under that 10% threshold? So understanding the legal requirements. Today we're going to begin understanding the legal requirements. We're going to talk about the demographic analysis. And each presentation I make to you in conjunction with, with Rocky um, and, and Bob Templeton, um, we'll be talking as well about the legal requirements. And then we need to talk about as we're developing proposed plans um, that meet not only legal requirements, 
but district needs. Um, how is it that we're going to get trustee input? How are we going to get community input in terms of getting that done by that December deadline so that we're ready to go for your May of 22 um, elections? And then we need to adopt a plan. Um, if you don't have um, a lot of changes, it's possible that we could have another meeting in November, consider a proposed plan. Sometimes it works where it is the plan that works for the board, and then we have a, um, a meeting, a special meeting to get public input, um, and maybe a, a, a community meeting as well, or do um, a survey online or seek public input on, on, online, um, and then at your December board meeting, we're ready to adopt a plan. Um, if there are going to be significant changes or significant concerns by the trustees in terms of what has happened in the past decade in terms of your population, we might need to have more meetings than that. Um, and there might have to be more draft plans than just one plan. Um, and so that's where I need to hear from you so we can develop a schedule that allows us to complete these tasks by December. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that later on tonight after I lay out some of the law and Rocky talks about some of the demographic shifts. Then I think we'll be in a mind space to kind of talk about the timeline for trustee and community input. But then the last thing that we will do in December, and I hope it's December as opposed to January, is adopt a final plan so that you're ready to go in January. So I've talked about it's this data that comes from the Census Bureau. What does the Census Bureau report. Well, there are two important pieces of data, and from that piece of data, a third piece of data um, is, is developed. The census reports total population, and that's the number that we use to see if your SMDs are well balanced. That's the number we use to see if you're within that 10% or over that 10% variance. And total population means every person within the jurisdiction, whether they're eligible to vote or not, whether they're a citizen or not, whether they're over 18 or not. It is everyone in the jurisdiction. But then there are two other measures we look at. We look at voting age population and citizen voting age population. Citizen voting age population is not reported from the Census Bureau. Let's go back to voting age population. Voting age population is, because that's part of information you provide to the Census Bureau as part of filling out that survey. Um, so that is a direct count, just like total population is. Um, so that is data that's released by the Census Bureau. Citizen voting age population is a combination of survey data over a period of time that comes out um, from the Census Bureau and other demographic agencies combined with an algorithm to figure out the relationship between citizenship and voting age. But it's not a direct count. It's more of a mathematical um, estimation. It's a pretty um, sophisticated estimation, but it's not a direct count of individuals like your total population or your voting age population. Um, voting age population and um, percentage um, and citizen voting age population tend to run very close for some demographic groups. For other demographic groups, there's a bit of a delta, and that's why we look at citizen voting age population when we're looking at voting strength. So if we want to figure out if a particular demographic group that has been more than 50% of a single member district maintains the same voting strength, we don't need to look at all of the people within a jurisdiction because all of those people can't vote. In fact, that would be a skewed view as to whether their voting strength is the same. We, look, we need to look at citizen voting age population because that's a better estimation of those who are actually eligible to vote. Now, it doesn't tell us those who actually do vote because it doesn't have voter participation rate, but at least it's a better estimation of those that are eligible to vote. And we compare that to your 2010 numbers to see if there's been any reduction in that voting strength as a result of the way the lines are drawn. And we try to eliminate the impact of that reduction so there's not what's called retrogression. So I've included some definitions for you of what total population is, voting age population, and citizen voting age population. But I've gone over those definitions already. But I wanted, to, wanted you to know that you do have them in writing in the presentation material. Now, your census data, we will be using various aspects of that data to answer three questions. Are my SMDs currently well balanced? That's the 10% threshold question. We're going to answer that tonight. Um, preview, no, they're not. You've had significant growth in the last 10 years. We're going we're to have to redistrict. Has there been retrogression 
um, since the last census or would the new proposed plan um, uh, signify retrogression? That's what we're going to use voting age population and citizen voting age population to look at. Tonight, we're only looking at whether or not you have to redistrict. When we look at retrogression, we're going to ask that question when we look at proposed plans because we're going to compare those proposed plans to the strength different minority groups had under the 2010 plan. So tonight we're not going to look at retrogression because we're just looking at your numbers and whether or not your numbers say you have to redistrict. But when we look at a proposed plan, we are going to take those voting age population numbers into account and citizen voting age population um, numbers into account to make sure we comply with the Voting Rights Act um, to the extent possible. But that compliance with the Voting Rights Act is a, a, it's, it's a narrow view. It can't be the overwhelming preoccupation of our work together. Because if it is, we have other federal statutes that we would violate. So we want to comply with the Voting Act, Voting Rights Act, but we also want to comply with the Constitution, um, the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which means that we can consider things like race and ethnicity and national origin but only to the narrow extent necessary to comply with a compelling governmental interest. Complying with another federal statute, like the Voting Rights Act, is a compelling governmental interest, but we can only do so in a narrow way. So meaning only to remedy a particular problem under the Voting Rights Act. Um, but it can't be the only thing that we take into account because we would be complying with the Voting Rights Act if we only considered race or national origin or ethnicity, but we would be violating the Constitution because we over consider race. So we have to um, walk that fine line where we can consider race because we have to in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act, but we need to be looking at other things like voting precincts, keeping neighborhoods together, keeping communities of interest um, together, um, preserving incumbent um, constituent relationships, um, observing natural boundaries and natural thoroughfares, using those to be the dividing line between single member districts. So there might be seven to nine criteria that we use to measure any proposed map by race. And when I say race, let, let's say retrogression, because that's a more nuanced um, consideration than just race or ethnicity. We're looking at um, dilution, unintended dilution would just be one of those criteria. Um, so it would be one out of nine or one out of seven, not just one out of one. And that is an appropriate consideration under the Voting Rights Act and under um, federal law, including the Constitution. And then do my S and Ds comply with traditional redistricting principles? Those things are not splitting voting precincts, keeping neighborhoods and communities of interest together, things like that. We'll be using your data and just looking at your maps and making sure that we um, comply with those principles. So tonight, our focus is on are our S&Ds based on the changes in population over the last 10 years well balanced? What does that mean? I've telegraphed it doesn't mean exact pop, uh, being exactly equal, but we've got to be roughly equal. And let me explain why that's important. If you can imagine a pie where you had a uh, thousand people in one SMD and two people in another SMD. And the thousand people get to elect one representative and the two people get to elect one representative. Who has the greater voting strength? It's those two people who are by themselves in that one SMD that get to elect a representative. They have much more voting power than the thousand who are in that second SMD. And so if you have SMDs that are just relatively unbalanced in that way, then you have relatively unbalanced voting strength. And that's why you want to bring them into substantial um, 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 equality. Not exact, but, that, but that's why. Um, because you want to um, um, normalize or relativize the voting strength across your entire system. And so... Now I'm going to ask Rocky to provide the demographic change analysis and note that you're looking for has the total population changed in such a way that your most populous and least populous districts are greater, the difference is greater than 10%, but I also want you to begin looking at some of the changes in voting age population. He's going to be presenting to you specific information about 
um, which demographic groups by SMD have increased and which ones have decreased. I think those will be interesting to you as you begin thinking about what does it look like in terms of developing some proposed maps, getting tr trustee input, and as well as getting um, individual uh, community member input. Rocky, can you hear us?
<coughs> so the overall population bear decline, um, maybe you can see that the uh, your percentages, they shifted a little bit, but they were really, your Bowdish population stayed very, very high, and even your Hispanic population decreased a little bit there. Next slide. Um, just for three, three, three to 9,500 persons, so just about 600 persons growth. Uh, when your ag population declined, this ag population grew, and we saw that both in your your VAP and your um, your total pot. Next slide. Yeah. 76.68. You can see 81A. But again, another district that declined. Uh, in, in, you know, your um, this was a decline in annual population, as, as well as your Hispanic population. So really across, across the board here, we saw a decline. Total other population in, increase. That, was, that, that little shift happened quite a bit. And that was a, kind of a national thing. It's just the way people kind of changed how they declared each other. Like, that's always that's a small category, but it, there's a lot of modern mix there. Uh, five, Again, you know, this is where you do these groups in Pennsylvania, almost 2,000 persons growth there, slide five. And I've been around the district as long as to know that that's really not a surprise. It's about that be your, large, your large jump there um, with the growth that we've seen out there in housing. Uh, you know, that is an area that we, uh, we, we did see significant growth. And you know, his added population was strong out there. Can make it to that? And District 6, please. Um, don't lose my word. 86, 16, 94, 60, 1,289 persons growth. Again, pretty good growth out there. The same same story. We just see, you know, all, over a thousand, almost a thousand um, new Hispanics in that area. And you can put your Anglo population decreased slightly. And this is reset. There we go. Just around the water there. You know, they declined a little, a little bit out, out that way. Um, the, the biggest decline was in the Anglo population there in District, district 7. With that, I think that's, you know, again, we added almost 1,400 persons in Brazosport during a 10 year period. We're now at over 62,000. Your, dif your difference was well over the 10% um, variation, so we definitely need to re redraw some boundaries. District 5, of course, was your largest district. The least populous was SRD 4 in 2010. That's, and, you know, it went from it went from 4 to 2 from 2010 to 2020, and of course, the redistribution is now required, and we'll be ready to kind of draw some new districts. Any, any questions, either regarding the current plan or the
um, it said that because the coverage formula that determined which jurisdictions are subject to a preclearance requirement, so before you implement a voting change, you get it pre-cleared by, um, by the Department of Justice, had not been updated in, say, four, updated in 40 years, we were having jurisdictions having to pre-clear their voting changes that had long since ended discriminatory practices. And so what the Supreme Court said is Section 5 preclearance requirement is still there, but we don't know who's subject to it until Congress comes up with a new coverage formula, and that's Section 4 um, of the uh, Voting Rights Act. So until Section 4 is updated with a new coverage formula, we don't know who Section 5, which is the preclearance provision, applies to, so we don't have to preclear. So the things that still exist are Section 2, which, are, which is the ability of an individual to sue a jurisdiction for a voting rights violation. And Section 3 is the ability, not for the Department of Justice to be looking at it on the front end in terms of preclearance, but to be looking at something on the back end under Section 3 to sue for a violation of the Voting Rights Act. So that Shelby County case affected Section 4, the coverage formula, Section 5, the preclearance formula, but what's still alive and well is Section 2, which you'll hear a lot about in Section 3. Thank you. No, my, my only question was, um, um, I know we have the population numbers and they went up and now our history population is 62,143. Am I correct that that's only the number of people that completed the census? Correct. Okay, so in our area, I feel pretty strongly that we have a large number of the population that are in school that their families didn't fill out the census plan. But there's no, anything, and I'm, I'm sure that's not anywhere else. I mean, that's everywhere else too, but there's no bridge. I don't know if bridge is the right word. There's nothing we can do about that part of it. No, state law so that all governmental entities, because remember, we use this information to apply for federal funds, to do federal state level apportionment, as well as to do local energy apportionment, and so that we're all kind of on a balanced playing field, they require us to use the same de data set. So we can't have jurisdictions saying, oh, well, we think, you know, this, this one data set didn't take into account this, this, and this, so we, we're going to use this data set over here. Um, so to have it nationalized and normalized across um, the country, we all use this one data set. And in Texas, your specific state law requirement for redistricting that's applicable directly to a school district says that we will use the census data and doesn't allow us to use any other data set. Okay. Great question. Do we know the delta between total population or estimated total population and census population? Uh, you mean the, the difference between how many people we think they are versus how many people it's actually fill out? Yeah. <laughs> if, if folks do, I have not heard that number yet. Rocky, have you heard? Uh, no, maybe not from, a, from, a, from our jurisdiction, but from a, like what the undercount what actually the under is in percentage this year. We have to I'm sorry, Rocky, I think I, I cut you off. Is there an undercount that's been re reported yet? There is, there is not. I mean, there's everyone, there's, everyone agrees that there is an undercount. Yeah. Every sense there is an undercount, um, but there is, there hasn't been anything released about what that what that could be. But but these numbers that we have in front of us are based on people that physically completed or actually completed the everything but the C map. Everything okay. but the C map. Correct. Right. And, and what we know we had less of this time around because of COVID is we had less of the door to door knocking on the door. Right. Hey, you didn't fill out your form. Can I sit down and Great question. Any other list? No. No. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's next. You've hired a demographic and legal team, so you can check that off the list of to, uh, to do um, items. We've briefed you on some of the legal requirements. We'll continue to brief them as they become important, depending on what analysis we're looking at for that night. Um, and something else that's not on here is you've gone through your actual census data and have seen, yes, you do meet that legal requirement that you need to uh, redistrict. What we need to talk about
about tonight are some redistricting criteria. I've told you some absolute things we have to comply with. Come back under that 10%. We can't violate the Voting Rights Act. And I've hinted at some other things that we can consider that are considered traditional redistricting principles. But I'd like to put them in a list for you um, in a second and see if that's something that you guys feel comfortable with. Because if you do, that is what Rocky and I will use as we're bringing maps to you for consideration. We'll keep those things in mind, making sure we comply with the things that are legally required, um, but to the extent that we can also comply with those other things, we will as well. Some maps may focus on more of the uh, discretionary things, one discretionary thing over another, to see what your preference is actually between those discretionary things. Um, but then we also need to talk about public input and trustee input, remembering that we don't have the full runway that we normally have, nine months. So we've got the rest of this month, November and December. So that really does shorten our timeline for getting that input. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have an opportunity to consider a map or alternative maps and then adopt the final plan. But what I really want to talk about are these criteria. These are very standard criteria. I, it would surprise me if these weren't the criteria that you adopted the last time around. Um, most um, uh, school districts or most entities adopt the same list. Um, so use of identifiable geographic boundaries for your s and boundaries when possible. Maintaining communities of interest such as neighborhoods, keeping um, like communities together. Um, accounting for other political um, uh, communities or political compactness including voting precincts and polling places. Now you don't have an average daily attendance under state law which requires you not to split a county precinct. If you were 150,000 ADA or more, you could not split a county precinct. Um, you're under that. Um, so you can split a county precinct. And given your size, we may have to split a few. Um, but to the extent possible, to the extent possible, um, we'll avoid doing that if that's something that's important um, um, to you guys. Um, Preserving existing SMDs um, to the extent possible, so doing as little disruption to your current SMD plan as possible, um, but keeping in mind that we have to respond to population shifts and we have to respond to the issue of retrogression if those population shifts would result in retrogression. So we're going to have to make some changes, but doing as least disruption as possible because, you know, kind of under the, um, the guise, you know, we don't need to fix something that isn't broken, except in the areas where it is broken, where we know um, that, that, we, that there are some areas that have to be um, um, addressed. Preserving incumbency, so not districting out current um, trustees out of their district. We're allowed to take that into consideration. That preserves continuity of leadership. It preserves um, the uh, relationship between constituents and the school district and the school board. So that's something that we're allowed to take into account. Um, adopting SMDs of relatively equal size, um, that means coming within that 10% variance. You can see that if you looked at your 2010 plan, they were relatively, you know, they were all right around the same, um, at least when you're looking at the thousand place, they were all around the same number, starting with the same number. It wasn't until you got until 2010 that there were different numbers looking at the thousand place. Um, adopt compact and contiguous SMDs. Your current SMDs are contiguous. Contiguous means you can take a pen and you can outline your SMDs without having to lift, lift your pencil. Um, and you can do that. There's, it's not like a jack or lantern where there's some like there's a hole in the middle or an island in, in, um, um, in, in, in the middle. Um, and are they compact? Compact it refers to not only physical compactness. That's why the shape doesn't have to be a perfect square or a perfect rectangle. We're allowed to consider community and political compactness, which sometimes affects the shape because keeping like um, communities together or neighborhoods together affects how square or how rectangular um, your SMDs are going to look because you're following the lines of that community um, or of that neighborhood. Um, avoiding retrogression, so that would be the, 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 the Voting Rights Act consideration, the Section 2 consideration. Notice it's only one consideration out of this laundry list that we have there. 
and then understanding that we make decisions based on race, ethnicity, national origin to the narrow extent necessary to comply with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but where we can focus on these other redistricting principles, we do. Um, but we have a federal statute we don't want to violate, and then we have a state statute that we have to comply with, which means staying under 10%. So to the extent that these are the criteria that we use to analyze any map that comes to the board, always remember that these criteria are always are going to be subordinate to two, coming under 10% and avoiding retrogression. Um, if any of these other criteria conflict with either one of those, we're going to comply with those two before we comply with some of the other criteria. So long as those other criteria don't come in conflict with those two, we'll comply with all of them. And what I like to think of these criteria is sort of the report card for any plan that comes before the board. The board will look at the plan and look at how, how well does it comply, how faithful is it to, the, to, to um, this criteria. Does it um, elevate one of the criteria over another? Do we like that elevation? Is that the same value that we as a board place on that, that, that criteria to extend it's not one of those mandatory ones, the 10% or the voting rights act? Those are the types of discussions that we will have. And so that our discussions um, about the plan will all be legally permissible and won't consider things that we're not legally allowed to consider or over-consider things that we're not allowed to over-consider, we should talk about, hey, I don't like this plan because it splits a, 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 a voting precinct. Or I'm not, I really don't like this plan because let's take a look at the citizen voting age. I think there's some retrogression here. Or can we move this line because I think it better reflects keeping a whole neighborhood together. Those are ways to talk about changes that you would like to see in a particular map using this language will keep us honest and keep us consistent with the law. Any questions about that? a discussion, if, if we can, if we have time, um, about it's October, we've got to get to December um, to adopt a plan. So what does it look like from October to December in terms of getting uh, trustee input and getting community input? Um, what some school districts have done is for their next meeting, allow Rocky and I, and when I say Rocky and I, primarily Rocky because he's the, he's the wonderful wizard here, um, to draw a proposed plan that gets us back into balance, 10%, and looks at, at or tries to avoid retrogression, and presents that to you for you guys to give some feedback, oh, but it splits the community, oh, but it splits the neighborhood. Oh, but did you realize about this natural boundary here? It's not a freeway, but it's another ba boundary that may not be readily apparent um, from um, survey um, information. Um, and, and, and you guys can, can react to that. Um, some school districts kind of like getting one proposed plan, not multiple, um, and being able to react to, hey, we know this plan gets us back into 10%. We know this plan is not retrogress retrogressive but I as a board member are going to provide some input on these other things based on what I know because I know my SMD, I know my district, and some things we, we, we want you and Rocky um, to consider. Um, that plan might be the plan that satisfies everything and then we might at that point be ready to go out for public input before final adoption or that plan may not be um, something that is um, satisfactory to all board members. You may want us to go back and consider something or tweak something um, and so then we might have to have an additional meeting before we're ready to go out for public input. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I'll jump in the first. I think you have to have something to start with, right? Otherwise, I think right. we shoot in the dark. We don't know how many people live on what street and where they're at in, in, in the deal. I, personally, I, I think that's the way to go, to start with a map when it's close, and then obviously note the differences between the two, current map and, and the new map, and then let's start discussion after that. Okay. And do you want to do this as full board work, or do you want to appoint a committee um, to look at the first map? Um, I think no. I think oh, 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 can, can we do it at 
next Monday school board meeting as public have a public hearing. Yeah, that's my, that's my we don't need the public hearing time. until we actually have a plan that we're okay. ready to adopt. Okay. So we just first need to take a look at some proposed maps that comply with those two um, requirements and then get some feedback from the board. And once the board is happy with the plan, then that's where we take it out and get public comment. I don't know that we'll be able to turn it around by next Monday. We would I need think that I've got a, a next Monday and Tuesday. I think I've got, I've already got meetings. I've got a, so I've got conflicts next Monday and Tuesday. So the question should be, when can it be met? <laughs> because if, if we wait till the November meeting, we're going to run into December as early as people are going to be. And we still do have up to January 19th. Yeah. time in January. I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to use it, but... I hear what you're saying about the contiguous and all that kind of stuff, but there's some goofy stuff from the last one, I, I'll just be honest, in my opinion, when I look at it. And as far as splitting communities, that's done. I mean, that's already, that's already in the mix, so I'm not sure we're going to be able to get away from that because this doesn't work out. Besides, you know, I represent the people, Joe represents the people, but we all there for the kids, so... His decisions he makes for my voters are the same I'm going to make for his voters. So that's not a big deal, especially as, as what, how many communities we have. So well, that's not a big deal for now because of this board, but well, that may not always be the case. So. Well, but, but I think I think if we look at, at you know, trying to get as many, because I'm the one with a small district. I didn't believe the numbers in 2010 because I thought it was too high. <coughs> and now, you know, we're down low, which still may be a little low. <laughs> but anyway, so, but looking at that, it, it's, it's, the question should be is when can we look at it again? Because if we wait till the November meeting, and we've got all these things that, hey, this doesn't work, and I'm concerned with this, you know, we're, we're going to get as far as behind. Yeah, then I we're going to have to rush, and then we'll... We probably have to make the assumption that most of these are going to be special yeah. meetings anyway, right? Right. I think so, yeah. So we're going to use our board meetings for normal board issues, and then these will be dealt with through special, and hopefully we can approve maybe at a special one, or a normal one in December. Is the goal. I guess the only concern I have is that with, I mean, we have two, two, uh, <coughs> two, two districts that are, you know, higher Hispanic. Even though the Hispanic population is more toward the three, three out of seven versus two out of seven. If you look at the total, the total population between Hispanic and Anglo. So, yeah, why there was only two, uh, I think I know because I was involved with City of Clute and we did two, and that was. We had to have two. Nobody wanted three. So I mean that was that was that was the reason that was done. Two would satisfy everybody at that point. Which is probably not the way to do it, but that, that's <coughs> the way to do it. So anyway, from so I mean looking at that, uh, and, and that's why I was asking questions about the citizens. You know, how do we determine if there's retrogression if we don't have that comparison? So we have to go back to the voting population, which if you look at if you look at some of the data on the citizens one the percentage drops pretty significantly from the vote. Sometimes by as much as 30 percent. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like, okay, that you know, uh, that that could be a, that could be something we need to question. So I think I think this is going to take some time to get these questions in and take a look at because there's a lot of data. So I don't think the week of um, October 18th, which is next week, would be feasible. Right. Rocky, what does the the week of October 25th? That's the last full week in October. What does that look like for you? Roughly your view. I think I could probably have, you know, we can, we've got some, some help now. I think we could probably create a couple plans by that week. Um, and again, we could present them virtually. We could, um, I could send them ahead of time, help, you know, whatever format you guys would like to be. That week. So if you wanted to have a special meeting that week before November, um, which would still give you an opportunity to have a special meeting in November and to use your regular board meeting as a member if you needed to. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've, got, I've got a question on Danny or Monty, I guess. November, I'm, I'm out. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that I can do this virtually or is it uh, from, from home? Is that possible? Yes, sir. Most definitely. Do you have a computer at home? I think. <laughs> 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 we'll send money your house. I don't know how to use it. We'll just set up. Yeah, uh, you can take that one home. You have it right there. Yeah. <laughs> it, to me, do you still like special?
special board meetings. Uh, let's get them taken care of. Uh, that way, I think is the easier, better way. But we're going to take some, like you said, it's going to take some time to talk through some of these things. We're going to see some things on the map that probably aren't good. So, it feels like we should be in dedicated I mean, sessions. If, if we wanted to use the regular meeting for, for public comment, for yeah. you know, 15 minutes or whatever, yeah. just to see, if, you know, if people are interested enough to come and look at a map, maybe. Well, we have, capabilities, we have capabilities to do all that electronically yeah. now, too, with surveys and things like that. I think we can send that out and no changes in the past, but, um, too, as well, to get enough public in input on it. We've already changed one boundary with zero input from the public. They never showed up, so we can do it again. Um, the, uh, one of the things I was, we keep talking about voting age and race and I assume sex probably is involved in that too. And is there a hierarchy within those when we start getting down to that level of which one has a higher priority or is it is it from a legal standpoint there? Uh, you mean between between race and and voting age or citizen mm -hmm. voting age? Uh -huh. They kind of go hand in hand because voting age population and citizen voting age is further broken down into specific demographic groups, mm -hmm. Anglo, Hispanic, African American, Asian, and other. Mm -hmm. And so when we're looking at voting age and citizen voting age, we're really looking at it not in the aggregate, but we're looking at it in those specific demographic okay. groups to look at retro. It already gets taken care of. It. Yeah. And is sex not a category? So. It is not a, a category with respect to retrogression, and it's not a category with respect to looking at total population. No. Seems odd, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Learn something new today. Head home. And I want to just to follow up on my question that like I said, Danny or Rebecca or Brittany did. While I can be on, be on the call on Zoom or be on the meeting in Zoom, if there's a vote taken, can I vote via Zoom? Is that legal? Okay. As long as you can see and you shouldn't have any votes in special meetings, I would assume, based on this is all be based once we have a final decision to... Yeah, there should not be... No, because be I still will be here for the November meeting. Yeah, but we can vote in December. Right. Yeah, we can hold each other for that final one. So long as a quorum is physically present right. here, then you can participate yeah. remotely. And full participation, including if there, if there were a need for a vote. Okay. But there shouldn't be. Yeah, Until we have two-way video tonight. We just have the screen being presented. So if we X out of the presentation, you could see Rocky. The, to, to his concern, though, the only vote that should take place in this is once we have come up with the final boundaries, correct? That's correct. Everything else is just you know, suggestion. And correct. And yeah, tonight you'll take action to accept it. Right, right. Um, right. And then we can... But during the process, there's no real... It's just a working correct. session. Correct. Of the cri I'll ask this guy. Of the criteria um, that are here that you've listed, um, are they listed in order of your what you think is the importance? No, they are not because uh, the statutory ones are embedded in there, um, so they're not listed in any in any particular order. Because um, I never know what order really the board is interested um, in the criteria, other than to say that the you know we can take all these things into account, but what we must comply with is coming within that 10 percent and not violating the Voting Rights Act. So wherever they're listed. They're actually number one and number two. So to, do we tonight determine the criteria, or is that another meeting? So if you're ready tonight to adopt the criteria, you could adopt the criteria as presented. Some things that boards do do is they kind of work with the criteria, and then in their resolution uh, adopting the plan, they identify the criteria that, w that was used in, or in order to adopt the plan, that the plan was judged by. So you can do it tonight. You can adopt your criteria tonight. You could adopt your criteria at some point in November, or you can just do it as part of the resolution on the final vote on the plan, indicating this was the criteria that was used. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess to that point, are there any other identified criteria that anybody would like to add? No, that was kind of where I was going with that. Yeah. The ones you have, then are, are there are there others that? Now, people always ask me, and I was really supposed to start off by saying this, you know, redistricting is not redrawing your attendance boundaries, because people always ask me about the 
connection between those two. Sure. Very different. And very impossible unless you did it from the get-go. You drew your SMDs to perfectly align with your, your attendance boundaries to do it now sure. because we have that 10% variance that we have to come between. And that almost invariably means you cannot perfectly align it. So some boards always want to put that in as a criteria, and that's almost always a criteria we have to violate because yep. we can't perfectly align it. So that's always a criteria that boards ask me about, and I always sort of advise against because I know probably we're going to have to violate it. Yeah, we, yeah we're way out. Yeah. But, but it might be worth adding, or at least discussion, that we keep current schools in current districts. Someone has a district or school in their district that they get to keep that school in their district. That might be, might might be difficult. Might be difficult. Or at least if they have a school in their district, maybe it would be a criteria. Maybe it's, maybe it's not the same one, but maybe a school. In what their we what we could do if you didn't want to adopt that as a criteria per se, when we bring the plan to you, we have several overlays that we can do. Yeah, that's a good um, and one overlay could be your school overlay. We could show you the school overlay in 2010, and you can and you can compare it to the proposed plan. Um, and so you can sort of organically see if any schools end up being in another SM single member district or another. Or you can adopt it as official criteria, but we certainly can do that overlay on the map. Personally, less worried about school boundaries than necessarily school location. Uh, we'll never get to school boundaries. No. So yeah, we can overlay the school location, you know, with a star that, you know, that school is, regardless of who's zoned to it, it's physically within this SMD or not within this SMD. A question, are we, are we required to keep the same number of districts or are we allowed to go to at large in any way? So Legally? you are required, as part of redistricting, y you've got seven SMDs, you keep seven SMDs. You are past the timeline, I believe, um, I'd have to double check, if you wanted to change and go to another electoral system, like go to a 5-2 system mm -hmm. or a 6-1 system. Um, you, you do have the ability to do that. Um, you don't have the ability, for example, to go, so seven is the most you can have. You right. can't go to eight or nine, um, unless you grow into the bracket of the school districts that are allowed to have nine SMDs. So there is a bracket um, that essentially applies only to Houston ISD. There's a bracket that essentially only applies to Dallas ISD. There's a bracket that essentially only applies to Austin ISD, and, and one that only applies to um, Fort Worth ISD. Um, um, so you would have to grow, grow in size to go into those brackets to allow you to, to go, and it's not going to, to eight, it would be going to nine. Yeah. So it would be jumping from seven to nine. No, I was thinking more of a five, two. But, but yeah, you still have, you, you, on another election year, when we are further away from your May election, you would have the ability to go to a, um, a five, two, or a six, one. Um, that process is a little bit more involved um, because you do have a, a very specific public input process, including publication in the newspaper in a very specific, um, have to have a public hearing, um, giving the notice, uh, giving the public a certain amount of notice. Um, in two orders, you would have to adopt an order changing your electoral system and then the map actually accomplishing that. The map accomplishing that still due 90 days before the election, but the order going to your new electoral system is either 180 or 120. I can't remember off the top of my head. It's one of those two. From your experience, is, is uh, a 5-2 plan um, for similar size? areas or school districts similar, uh, good or bad, or is it popular or not popular? You know, it, it depends. There are, pr there are pros and cons. Um, you know, with a 5-2 plan, you've got two at-large. So some school districts say that we like the at-large outlook, um, even if for um, uh, a more diverse representation on the board, we have to be single-member districts. We don't want to lose the at-large outlook. Um, some school districts say, um, or some folks say, that one of the downsides about being single member district is a tendency to think about my district, uh, meaning geographic district, right. as opposed to the school district as a whole. And by having a mixed system, either um, a, a 6 1 or a 5 2, you combine sort of the best of both worlds um, more diverse representation, um, someone to hold that, that community member.
members can hold specifically accountable for by geography, but then someone who is elected at large so they have a, a more comprehensive view of issues as opposed to issues that are geographic specific. Um, sometimes that works out um, to be true, those sort of philosophical views of, about um, mixed um, SMDs versus pure SMDs, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes, you know, a 7 system can produce um, results that are as district-wide focused as, you know, a pure at-large or a 5-2 or a 6-1. It really depends on your community. Um, but, but you hit upon some of the kind of philosophic differences between the, 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 the electoral systems that people off, often cite. Do you think even, even due to the basis of us having to go to the single me member district, which was really a lawsuit that, that they would just take to go backwards like that? Easy? So if it was a lawsuit, um, I'd have to take a look at the order requiring you to go to single go to single member districts because that order may give the court continuing jurisdiction, and so we would have to reopen that lawsuit to ask for permission to change the electoral system. Um, so if yes, you're correct. If, it, if it's the basis of a lawsuit, thank you for bringing that um, to my attention. If the court retains continuing jurisdiction to administer enforcement, we would have to go back to. Questions? Are we going to shoot for October 25th? Are we set? Everybody good? Rocky, yeah. the first day of that week work for you, October 25th? Monday's our normal night. Okay. Yeah, well, that will happen. As soon as I feel like you have it that week, I thought I'd probably say Monday. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 